I can see of you, it's glad y'all here. <laughs> so far back there, I can't see that far, but it's good. Y'all know we done had church this morning one time? Y'all realize that? Boy, it wasn't but a few minutes, we finna have church again, I tell you. All right, I'm, I'm your new Ross Carter this morning, so don't pay no attention. All right, brother, kick her off back there, and we'll see where we head this time. All right. Glad you knew.
see y'all. Well, it's like there's something, something wrong with these front rows over here. <laughs> kind of got a bunch of It's good to see you here today. Brother Steve, he's a blessing. We're glad to have him filling in for Ross today, and uh, very thankful to have each of you here, especially visitors. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us uh, for this Sunday. We, we appreciate you coming. Praise the Lord for you. Uh, I do have a few announcements that I want to share with you. Uh, let's see, our Kingdom Man Bible study is going to be starting up this Tuesday night. Brother Phillip's going to be leading that for us. Uh, this is a, I told you, that looks like him in that picture. I look like Phillip Smith in that picture. He's going to be leading that uh, Tony Evans Kingdom Man Tuesday night, 6.30, a six-week study. Uh, any of our men that can come, we'd love to have you come uh, and be a part of that. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer if you'd like a book. Uh, please get signed up for that today, and uh, we'll get that to them. Appreciate that. Also, we're doing the Christmas shoebox ministry. There's a basket in the back on a table. If you'd like to make a donation, we can buy the stuff for you. If you'd like to get the stuff, there's a list on the table. You can go get your own stuff to pack the box, uh, and, and we'll be doing those boxes after October the 18th, uh, getting ready for the shoebox deal. That's a, a wonderful ministry that we thought we had lost because of the coronavirus, but right at the last minute, kind of, they put it back together. So we're scrambling trying to get that done. Very excited about that. Uh, we're doing a trunk or treat. Uh, here on the uh, 25th Sunday afternoon at 6 o'clock. Uh, this is kind of a carnival type atmosphere. We're going to set up uh, different vehicles in the parking lot, trucks and cars, uh, uh, decorate the back of them, have a fun game and candy for the kids, and it's just going to be a big old time. So we're going to be outside there in the parking lot doing all of that, uh, and it's going to be a blessing. So if you'd like to participate in that, if you'd like to do one of them, there's an orange sheet of paper in the back that you can fill out uh, and put on there what you'd like to do uh, and put your name down, uh, and you can, you can fix one up. Uh, and if not, you're still welcome to come. Uh, and be a part of it. We've got several that are going to be involved in it, and it looks like it's going to really be a blessing. So you come for that. Uh, also, we're going to be starting back Children's Church. Amen? Amen! Start back Children's Church uh, in November. Everybody's excited about that. Uh, and so Children's Church will be kicking back off the first Sunday in November. Also want to ask if anybody is interested in helping with Children's Church. Uh, this is an all-hands-on-deck situation. Amen. That's a joke. A good one. Uh, better, than it, better than the response. I can tell you that was a good joke. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, we'd love for you to come and help with that. The more that get involved in this, uh, the, the better the rotation is and the less often you'll have to keep it. So uh, if anybody would like to help with Children's Church, please let us know about that. You can call the church office anytime during the week uh, and let us know. Just say, the Lord has ministered to me and I feel led to come and help with Children's Church. Amen. Uh, and we'd be glad to have you come and be a part of that. Uh, a couple of other announcements that are not in the bulletin. One, uh, many of you know Miss Tony Greer. Uh, has been in ICU down in Houston uh, for a little over a week now, looking at maybe two to three more weeks. Uh, she has not improved a whole lot. She has uh, pneumonia uh, on top of her cancer stuff that she's been dealing with for a couple of years now. Uh, and we've asked uh, uh, everybody to be praying for their family. Uh, Mr. Bobby is down there at this time. He's staying in a, in a, in a actually I didn't know this, but just two miles from the uh, MD Anderson campus, they have a uh, RV mobile home type park. Uh, and he was able to take his camper down there and right in the middle of Houston, Texas. Uh, and they say it's a really nice, gated, safe place for people that are going through stuff to stay. Uh, but there is some expense there. He's staying. They're both self-employed, so they're both out of work uh, at this time. And we want to be a blessing to them as a church family. So next Sunday, we'll be receiving a love offering for this family uh, to try to help them with their expenses. Uh, so you just come ready to be a blessing to them. Uh, and we know whatever the Lord moves us to give, he can take and multiply and use. Uh, to really help them at this time. But most importantly, we ask you to continue to pray uh, for them, uh, that the Lord will heal her body and get her through this, uh, and we sure love them and, and pray that, uh, that God will do a work there. So be praying about that next Sunday. We're going to take the love offering up for their family, so you come ready for that. Uh, I also wanted to announce to you this week, I'm going to be in Revival at Pilgrim's Rest, our old church up at Spearsville, and 11th Hour is going to be doing the music, and they wanted us to invite everybody to come if you'd like to come one night. Uh, it's going to be at 7 o'clock Monday, Tuesday, and you need to be here Wednesday because they're going to have a service here, and you don't want to miss it. Uh, so you'll be here Wednesday night, but Monday or Tuesday, if you'd like to come to Pilgrim, we'd love to have you. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Is there any other announcement? Something we failed to mention or didn't know about? Y'all ready for church? Say Amen. Amen. Oh, it's, that's a good hearty amen right there. We're ready to roll. Amen. Y'all got the hurricane, hurricane blues, right? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you today for loving us. And we thank you today that, God, even through the storm, we woke up this morning to a blue sky and a, and a shining sun and, and, Lord, just your faithfulness. And I pray today, Lord, no matter what we're going through or where we are, I pray today that you have your way. Uh, Lord, ministered our hearts today. I, I, we've came to worship. We're, we're not here for anything other than to give you the glory that's due your name and God to do our best uh, to receive a message from song and sermon uh, that might help us get through the, through the next week and, and Lord, to another day of worship. 
Uh, but God, we thank you for what you're doing in our church family. Thank you for souls saved and lives changed. For the privilege again today to baptize somebody that's been saved. And uh, we just pray that you'll continue to move, continue to work uh, in and through our church family and, and the ministry here. Uh, that we continue to shine the light of the Lord. And God, we pray today for Brother Stevie and these that uh, play our instruments, that you just bless each one today and help the voice of the congregation, Lord, as we sing, uh, that you be blessed in this place, that you be magnified and glorified and lifted up. And we'll be careful to thank you for it. Lord, do what you can do. And we'll thank you and praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Luke. Would y'all mind doing a little this morning? Let's give this live band a hand clap of praise. Okay? Let's all stand at 2.15. I know this is the older crowd, so y'all can stand. 2.15, and let's worship the Lord in majesty this morning. All right. Boy, it is good to see this group. You can see it when they stand up. Let's go, brother.
chorus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It's easy to love somebody that loves you first, isn't it? Well, what about those people that don't love you? Now, here's where we go. Standing on holy ground. Y'all can last for one more, I know. Okay, musicians, hit it. Standing on holy ground. That's what we're standing on. We are standing on holy ground. Sing us a song about amazing God that Brother Ruby's doing. God bless our hearts. Okay, brother. <coughs> yeah. You want to hear the stories of how I made it through when life is full of troubles, pain, and fear. The answer may sound simple, though everything else crumbles. One thing has remained through all these years. I still serve an amazing God. He still cares, He still heals, He still mended broken hearts and trying tears. This old world is bound to change, but I'm glad. And my song will ever be Oh, amazing God, you're still amazing me The God who parted the waters Still makes a way today He's always brought me through 
through life's troubled seas. The one who fed the thousands, whose words could calm the tempest. He's my bread of life, and he is my peace. I still serve an amazing God. He's been with me every mile, my weary feet is trod. He still cares, he still heals. Trying tears. This old world is bound to change, but I'm glad I know the one who always stays the same, and my song will ever. Trying tears, this old world was bound to change, but I'm glad I know the one who always stays the same, and my song will ever be. Some of you might not know this. He and I served together at Faith and Bastrop. And uh, you should have seen him when I found him. <laughs> I got him fixed up, and now the Lord's using him. So thankful for that. <laughs> Amen. What a blessing. And like I said this morning, you ought to see how he acts when Miss Sue's not around. Uh, she, she keeps him restrained, if you can imagine. Anyway, no, I appreciate them being here. Appreciate him filling in for Brother Ross today. And pray that Brother Ross and them have a good trip, and safe trip home, and get some rest. And appreciate them. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, if you want to open your Bibles with us there, that's right after chapter 1. Uh, we're on a roll this morning. Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at a few verses together. Y'all stand if you can, if you're able. Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra stood at the water gate to preach the word of God. The Bible said when he opened the books of the law of Moses, the people stood up in honor of the word, and that's that's where we get this from, and that's why we do that. It's biblical to, to honor uh, the word of God together. So Nehemiah chapter, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through verse 16 is where we'll be. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, 
that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. The other night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, as the hurricane came through, the power began to surge. And I don't know if anybody else has did this, but our air conditioner was making a noise where it went vroom, vroom. And so I jumped up and turned the air off because I didn't want to burn that up. It ended up throwing a breaker uh, on that that we had to fix yesterday. And the lights for about 15 minutes would just surge and get bright and dim, and bright and dim. And over time, it'll give you a headache uh, doing that bright and dim. And I thought to myself, as I watched that light blinking on and on and on, I kept wondering, is the power going out? And I'd get on Facebook, and everybody is their power. You could see different sections as people's power was going out. People say, power out in here, power out here, power out there. And it went right down the list as people were talking about how their power was out. And it just started in my heart. Of course, then the power did go out. I was sitting there in the dark, so I didn't have anything else to do but think. Um, <laughs> and I got to thinking about the power going out. And then I got to thinking about God and what he's done for us, and what he's done in us. And I, and I just worked on this message and titled it as such, Is the Power Out? I, I don't know what you feel today about what God's done in you. But the question throughout the message is this. Is the power that he has worked in us proportionate to the power that's being worked through us? And I pray that this will bless you today. Father, we ask you today to bless the message, use it, accomplish your will. And I pray today, Lord, that you'd help us to be revived, to be renewed, and God, to walk in your power. Forgive our sin. Lord, uh, clean our minds, our hearts, and prepare us to receive your word. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. So in Scripture, there's several passages of Scripture. I, I was raised in a church not much different than ours. Uh, our church at Sibley there, we, we would have different speakers come through and preachers come through. And we had an annual missions conference where missionaries from all over the world would come in. Uh, they would share uh, uh, their, their missionary experiences, kind of like when Brother Charlie's been here, or Brother Bill, Brother Luke that's come uh, and shared about their ministries and tell us what God's doing in and through them. Uh, and I heard this expression my entire life. The power of God. I've heard people talk about the power of God. I've heard people uh, uh, talk about it and, I, and preach about it and sing about it my entire life. And as I sat there the other night, I wondered how much I've heard about the power of God versus how many times I can honestly say that I've seen it. How many times that I've heard about the power of God, even preached about the power of God, how many times I've actually experienced the power of God. When we consider the power of God, there is a whole huge spectrum of things that we could talk about. And, and I want you to understand that the power of God can operate and manifest itself in many ways. But I believe that there could definitely be a case made, and there's not even a near second, that the most powerful thing that God has ever done is to save a soul. That the most powerful thing God's ever done in your life, if you're a Christian today, is to save you. Now the Bible says this in Matthew chapter 6 verse 13 at the end of what we call the model prayer or the Lord's Prayer. Jesus closes with this example of how we should consider our structure for our prayer. As he prays, he says when we pray to the Lord, we conclude with this. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the, what we call the great commission to the church and where Jesus basically tells the church to go and preach the gospel to every nation and to bring those who are saved and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost and teach them to observe all the things that the, that the Lord commanded the church. He says this in Matthew 28, verse 18. All power is given in me or unto me in heaven and in earth. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, Jesus said, But as many as received him, but to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And this is somewhat summarized in what Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 when he makes this declaration. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Listen, for it is the power of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So I would say to you that the greatest example, see there are things, there are talented people. There are people who have great seasons in their life. There are people who have great years. There are people who have big days in their life. 
But I would say to you that the best example of the power of God is an all-inclusive thing. We understand today there are certain people who have certain abilities, certain talents. There, there's not anybody that sings like Stevie Pace. Amen? There's not anybody that plays instruments like these instruments are played. There's not anybody who preaches like I preach or preaches like Brother David preaches or does what you do. People have different talents, different abilities, and this one can't experience what that one can't experience and vice versa because we're all individuals and we're all unique in our own way. But I want you to know that the power of God that brings salvation is uniquely and perfectly available for everybody in the room today. Where there are some that might not experience glimpses of the power of God. You might not ever stand in the power of God and preach a message. You might not ever stand in the power of God and deliver a, 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 a message or an invitation for people to come to Christ or sing a song that will stir our souls. You might not stand in the power of God in a time of prayer and pray through a tragic situation with somebody. But everybody in here can stand in the most powerful place of God and that is in the place of salvation. The salvation, I believe, is the most powerful thing in all the world that God does. I ask you this, as believers, is what God poured into you being proportionately poured out of you? If you consider the investment He made in us, and then you consider the return. If you think about it on an individual level, the power that God exercised in your life, how does that measure up to the power that you're allowing Him to bring into this world through your life. And I, I can honestly say that it, it, it caused me to be ashamed of, to consider how much God's done in me versus how much I have allowed Him to do through me. And then as the pastor of the church, I couldn't help but consider this. How much God has done for us. and How much God has done in us versus how much we've allowed Him to do through us. I read a devotion one time. Did y'all know I could read? <laughs> reading by, by, by tape. You know, that's still reading, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. So the devotion was titled Turning Success into Significance. And the point was, is a lot of times we clamor for success. And we want to be successful. And we want to make money. And we want to uh, make a name for ourselves. But then what? Once you've climbed that mountain and you've, you've become financially secure and you've become uh, 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 sound in your life and you, you, you're confident in where you are, is it just for us to reach that plateau and enjoy it? Or is it for us then to be some of the few who are able to achieve those positions and take them and use them to make other people's lives better? Well, it's the same in the church. You know, when our kids were born and, and they, were, they were drinking the bottle and then you would, you would put at about six months, seven months, eight months, you start putting that rice cereal in there and fluffing it up a little bit and buddy, they'd get full of that bottle and fall out and just, just I'm talking about be snoring, sound asleep, rubbing their belly and I'd lay down right beside them and like, whoo, it's good to me too, baby. Listen, <laughs> that's cute. But how ridiculous would it be to see a six-year-old baby walking around with a bottle in his mouth. If you go to the doctor, they measure them. They weigh them. They check everything. They ask their parents how they're doing, what they're doing, because they ought to be some sort of sign of progress. Well, it should be the same in the church. And when you consider today what's happened here in the last six and a half years, and for that matter, the last 120-something years, that God has blessed us with the church and God has given us what He's given us. I ask the question again, somewhat ashamedly, since I are the pastor, <laughs> is what's coming out of here proportionate to what's been put in here? Is what we're sending out... See, a lot of times churches say, well, how big is your church? Well, it depends what you're talking about. How big is the noise we make? How big is the occupancy? How big is our influence? How big a place do we cover? Or, or how big is the impact that we're making? Because there's several things to be considered. But I want you to know that God is not near as concerned about our seating capacity as He is about our sending capacity. And God's called us and God saved us to not just receive and enjoy the blessing of the power of God, but to receive and transmit, if you will, the power of God through our lives into the lives of other people. And so is the power getting out? 
Is the power of God that's been worked in us when He saved us getting out? And I, I'll contend with you this morning as we look to this passage of Scripture that where we could say the most powerful thing that God has ever done. Listen, God, God formed the earth. He spoke the heavens into existence. Formed the earth with His hand. Carved out the valleys. Pushed up the mountains. Dug out the seas with His own hands. He hung it out in the middle of nothing. Told it to stay there. And it stood there. He spoke light into existence. And there was light. Before He gave dominion to the light over the moon and the sun and the stars. He has done some incredibly powerful things. But nothing more powerful than descending His throne, laying down His crown, picking up my cross, humbling Himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and dying for our sin so that peasants, sinners, rebels like me and you could be saved. When you consider the power of God, I'll say this, the most powerful thing He could do in us is save us, and the most powerful thing that we could then express that power in our lives through is by living our lives wholly and consistently for the glory of God. Anybody can preach a good sermon. Anybody can have a good week. Anybody can string together a good month or a good year. But what about people who desire wholeheartedly to consistently and faithfully serve the Lord no matter what? Those are the people we need. Those are the people we're missing today. People who will plant their feet and stick with it for the glory of God because He's worth it. He's worth it. I had a young man that I'm friends with surrendered to preach. He called me this week. He said, I want to tell you something. I said, what? He said, man, God's called me to preach. I said, welcome to the most miserable joy you've ever experienced. Amen? I told him, I said, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not surprised. But I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for you. And he said, I just feel so unworthy. And he went about why he felt so unworthy. And I said, let me tell you something. You can go to seminary and get you a doctor. You can pastor you three or four churches, read the Bible frontwards and backwards 15 times and do this for 40 years. And you know what? You still won't be worthy. There's still no worthiness in our serving the Lord. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be faithful. We're not worthy, but He is. So we do what God's called us to do. So in this passage of Scripture, just a few things we'll grab this morning as we consider that thought of the power getting out of the power going out of us that's been worked in us, I want you to see what it takes for us to live our lives holy, for us to live our lives faithfully. Anybody can stand one day, one hour, one moment. But what about people who plant their feet and serve the Lord? Paul said in verse 12 that it takes devotion. Paul said in verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed. Isn't that a, isn't that a, that's a sermon in itself. Always obeyed. That you've always done what God has called you to do. He's talking to a church. Can I tell you that he's not talking to a church that's never made a mistake? He's not talking to a church that's always been perfect. He's not talking to a church that's full of perfect people. But he's talking to a church full of people who in spite of their errors, in spite of their mistakes, in spite of their stumbling, they've stayed faithful to the Lord. And he's saying to you, this, what he calls, we're going to say devotion this morning, is for their ability to, he said, not only when I was there as your leader, but even more so in my absence, you have remained faithful to do what God has called you to do. He says to them, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I heard a guy preach a message that one time on this passage, and he titled it, working out of you what God has worked in you. Being able to work out our salvation. That our salvation was not given to us to be considered a milestone or a landmark or a monument that we just look back to, that we just celebrate, that we just talk about, but that our salvation is a living thing this morning. Our salvation is an operable thing this morning. Our salvation is something that was not only worked in us, but as we surrender to the Lord, our salvation works continually through us to accomplish the purpose and the will of God. That we've got to have devotion to do what God's called us to do. We've got to have discernment to be able to live our lives faithfully and wholly and consistently as God's called us to do. And again, I say the most powerful thing that's available for the believer is available for every believer. And that is for us to stand in the power of God and consistently do what God has called us to do no matter what. He says, verse 13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The discernment our ability to understand 
with, with something to back it up. Our ability to gather and to fathom in our minds and our hearts. And this is hard for us because we like to be independent. We like to be free. We want everybody to be able to stand on their own. But the reality is nobody needs to stand alone. Nobody needs to stand alone. You're better off with a spouse. You're better off with a family. You're better off with a church. Amen? Amen. Nobody ought to have to go through life by themselves. And you don't have to. And let me tell you more than that, you're better off with the Lord. Amen. Amen. To have the Lord on your side and in your life. Listen, we gather this. He's called us to serve Him. And He's called us to do it for His own good pleasure. God, let, can I hurt your feelings? If I was one of the preachers that said, look at your neighbor, I'd say, look at your neighbor and say, Brother Rib's going to hurt your feelings. But I'm not one of those preachers. <laughs> You're not God's favorite. <clears throat> womp, womp. <laughs> Antioch. You're my favorite, but you're not God's favorite. And that's okay. We're all just a part of his plan. And that kind of takes the burden off of us. To, to, to think that we have to be the best, or to think that we have to be the greatest, God didn't call us to be either. He called us to be faithful. See, God would rather us run 200 people for 20 years than run 2,000 people for two. Anybody believe that? What good is it to build a monument and then tear it down? What good is it to have a party and then the party's over? Turn out the light. Anybody? Sorry. Had a moment. <laughs> Almost did it in my Willie voice. I can actually sing just like Willie. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> the party's over. Anyway, so here we are. Listen to me. The most important thing you can do in your life is not be a shining star for 15 minutes, but to be able to get 20 years down the road and look back and say, God's been good. That God stayed faithful and I kept doing what God's told me to do. That means you're going to have to get up a whole bunch of times and stop making excuses. You're going to have to dust the dirt off your britches more than once. Because if you know anything about living this life, you're going to fall. You're going to trip up. You're going to stumble. You're going to make mistakes. And that's okay. God knows you better than you do. He didn't call us to be perfect. He called us to be a part of what it is that He's doing. And we're to do that not because we feel good, not because it's convenient, not because it's easy, but we do it because it is the good pleasure of His will. Because He's pleased by faith and a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him, those who come unto Him believing that He is. Well, what is He? He's a sustainer. He's a forgiver. He's a gracious God, a merciful God. These attributes would not be listed if that's what God did not want us to know about Him. And if God did not want us to know He was merciful, then we wouldn't know he was merciful. But he knows we need to know that because we get in a bunch of messes. <laughs> and that's alright because God is merciful. He's faithful. So keep coming back. Keep coming back. You say, I blew it this time. That's alright. You'll blow it again. But God is faithful. And he still loves you. And he still wants to use you. We've got to quit quitting on God. We've got to quit coming up with excuses to back out and to bail out. Just keep going forward for the glory of God. What is it Micah 7 said? Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. Get up and do what God's called you to do. Stop complaining. Stop making excuses about it. Devotion, verse 12. Discernment, verse 13. You ready for the third one? There's four of them. Hang on now. Dedication in verse 14 and 15. Verse 14, the Bible says this. Have y'all read it yet? They read it before I did this morning and they started laughing before I got to it. Because this takes dedication. This is where we got to be dedicated. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. Stop complaining all the time. That's what that means. Stop griping about everything all the time. God's people should be the most content and thankful and joyful people you've ever met. But more often than not, we all know a group of Christians who are the whiningest, gripingest, complainingest group of folks you ever met in your life. And it ought not be that way. You know where we were introduced to murmuring in the Bible? We, we, we learn the most about murmuring when God takes the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage which we have all preached and believed that being delivered from Egypt was a picture of God delivering this Christian people from our sin. That when God saved you, it was a picture, or rather that God taking Israel out of Egypt was a picture of when God saved you. 
that He delivered us from the bondage of our sin. And you know what happened? They went into the wilderness. And you know what happened? God met their every need. And you know what happened? They griped about it. Sound familiar? I went to the store the other day. Can I be honest with you? I went to the store the other day. We were going to cook some fish. I preached a revival, and this guy didn't know that I could catch fish, and he didn't know that I knew David Burns, so he didn't know that I had a freezer full of fish already, and I didn't tell him no different. <laughs> Amen? And so I went down there and preached that revival, and that guy come up, and he said, I'm a fisherman. And I said, really? What is that? And he said, well, you go and catch fish. <laughs> Anybody? I'm just making as dumb a joke as I can. Somebody's going to laugh eventually. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> so... The last night of revival, he comes in with an ice chest full of fish. He already cleaned them and bagged them up. And, I, you know, I was like, man, here we go. So I brought them home. We just, we just had us a fish fry. Well, I needed a couple things for the fish fry. I went to the store. Have y'all ever done this? I went to the store to buy some stuff to fry some fish for my wife because she likes to eat. And I went to the store to buy the stuff to fry the fish. And I probably went in to spend about 20 and came out with $150 worth of stuff. Y'all ever do that? I end up with a buggy full. And I'm looking around thinking, why in the world? You walked by stuff and you didn't need it, but all of a sudden you saw it and now you need it. You didn't even want it, but now don't go to the grocery store hungry. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So I'm filling the buggy up. I'm, I'm walking up so happy. I get up there, they rung me up and told me how much it was, and I thought, I, didn't, I wasn't supposed to do that. And the time I got in the truck, you know what I thought? How many people in this world will never experience being able to go to the store and buy more than they need? How blessed people are we? And I guarantee you the poorest one in the room today has done that very thing. Maybe not to that extent because you have more discipline than I do. But I guarantee you that every one of us at some point went to the store to get one thing left with two. Went to the store to get a bag and left with a buggy. It's an incredible thing to consider how blessed we are and yet still some of the most negative, <coughs> critical, cynical people in all the world. And that's what he says here because this is what spoils us from letting the power out. This is what keeps us from getting the power out. This is what throws a, a wet blanket on the fire of God, is when people start complaining. There was a lot, you know what went on? Do you know what went on in the wilderness? Read your Bible. Read the Bible. But let me tell you what went on in the wilderness. Idolatry, adultery, fornication. There was all kinds of rabid sin that took place in the wilderness. You know the one that got them in the most trouble? Murmuring. Complaining about what God had done for them. God got enough of this. He got a belly full of this. And I'm going to tell you something as a pastor. I can deal with a drunk. I can deal with a drug addict. I can deal with an affair. I can deal with anything you bring. You've got guts enough to do it. God will give me grace enough to help you through it. But I promise you this. There's one thing I don't. I get a belly full. And I got a big belly. And I get a belly full of it in a heartbeat. That's griping and murmuring and complaining. When God's been so good to us, we ought to all flood this altar and just say thank you Jesus this morning. There's churches who crawl through hell backwards to have what this church has got, and we just ought not complain about nothing. He's been good to us. Do not, he said, do not do anything. That word all means all, and that's all all means. We like it when it applies to the good stuff, but here's where it applies to the bad stuff. Do all things without murmurs and disputing. And here's what disputing is. Disputing is when two murmurs get enough of each other's murmuring and start fighting about it. That's where the dispute comes in. One gripe and the other one gripes. Who wants to see who can out gripe the other one? So this one gripes and that one gripes and that one gripes and this one gripes. And one of them gets the better of the other one because he's got more to gripe about than the other one. They get mad and start fighting about it. That's dispute. Hear what he said. Do it all in light of that. Notice that he said that on the heels of saying that we are here to serve and do by the good pleasure of God what God's called us to do. Verse 15 he goes on and says this, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Does that sound familiar? Is anybody a crooked and perverse nation? And he goes on and says, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So he's telling us that in order for us to be harmless, isn't that a funny word that he uses there? <coughs> Which what he suggests, no, no, not suggests, what he literally says is that it's harmful for believers to do what we do with murmurings and disputes. I know churches that fall apart because of people that can't keep their mouths closed. They can have an outbreak of sin. I'm talking about, I, I, I've heard of some of the awfulest sinful mess you've ever heard and churches overcoming, but they can't 
overcome a wagging tongue and a loose mouth person that can't be satisfied with nothing. And I can't help but believe if you can't be satisfied with anything God's doing, then maybe you've never been satisfied with God in the first place and you just need to be born again. I'm going to sit here till somebody says it. Amen. Nope, I'm going to sit here till more people say it. Amen. We'll add a 12:30 service to the program. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Harmless, blameless sons of God. See, God's whole desire for us is not for the world to know that we're a great preacher or that we're a great church. He just wants people to know that we're his children. Amen. Isn't that good? Because some of us may never be great preachers. But we can all be his children. Identifiably so. Harmless, blameless, sons of God. And he goes on to say this, without rebuke. That means that they can't say anything about us. All they can say in the middle of the perverseness of this country, in the middle of chaos, in the middle of turmoil, in the, in the middle of the trouble that befalls this land, all they can say is God's people stay faithful. To do what God had called them to do. To keep doing what God had called them to do. To keep on, keeping on, keeping on. It takes devotion. It takes discernment. It takes dedication. And it takes direction. Listen to what he says. Holding forth the word of life. You know in vacation Bible school, we used to have the pledges. Y'all remember that back when we could have vacation Bible school? And we had, we had the pledges and they would have the kid. And I'm going to tell you something. When I was a kid, so I was not necessarily what you would call conventionally and traditionally a good kid. Uh, my mama sent me to every Bible school. and t if, they, if they'd keep me long enough for her to have a cup of coffee and just calm down for a minute, she'd take me. So I knew every church. I knew every teacher. I knew every preacher, every pastor. And I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing, you hear me, nothing bigger in vacation Bible school than being able to hold one of them flags or hold the Bible for the pledge. That is the Michael Jordan of VBS. So you get to hold the stuff. And you remember when the kid holds the Bible. You know the two that hold the flags, but the one that holds the Bible is right in the middle. He's right out front. And you give them that big old fan. I always wonder, why do we give that little old bitty kid the biggest Bible we've ever seen? That little kid, he's in there trying to hold that big old Bible. That kid will hold that Bible right out in front of them. And we'll say our pledges to the flag, and then we'll say our pledges to the Word of God. And they hold that Bible out in front of them. When he makes this statement to us, I gotta, how to end up with the Bible upside down? When he makes that statement to us in verse 16, holding forth the Word of life, he's kind of talking about doing like that. Because see, if I enter into a business relationship, and this is in front of me, things are going to be all right. If I enter into a marital relationship, if I want to stay in my marital relationship, if I want to raise my kids to do right, I need to do it with this between us. I, I need to walk out of this church today with the Word of God going forth before me. A lamp to my feet, a light to my path, hiding its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. i got to hold forth the Word of God. And how many things have we suffered great failure, great hurt, great tragedy in our lives? How many hard lessons have we had to learn because of the times that we took this and put it back here? We were in a program when I was in the youth called Teen Discovery. And they had a shirt that had three crosses on it and it was like a comet going around it and it said Discovery. You know, t-shirts didn't look as cool in the 90s as they do now. It was just a heather gray shirt with a real weird looking graphic on it, but we did the best we could with what we had. Me and some buddies of mine were going to get into something one day, and it was something not very becoming of a kid that was in the youth group. Anybody? Y'all were all good kids. I had some moments. Amen? And I was walking. I'll never forget. I was walking by the house, out of the house. I walked by the bathroom. In our bathroom, if the door was open, you could see the mirror. And I walked by, and I glanced at that mirror, and I saw my Teen Discovery shirt on. Now, I'd love to tell you that I got so convicted and moved by God that I repented, and I did right. But I didn't. But what I did do is go change shirts. <laughs> See, there's a lot of times we'd like to do that. We want, you know the expression, have your cake and eat it too? Anybody else on the diet trying to? All those illustrations just bubble up. A lot of times we'd like to put this back here when it's convenient for us. We'd like to stick it under here. 
And when we need it, then we go get it. But we get ourselves in a lot of trouble by putting this on the back shelf and trying to figure it out on our own. When I'm telling you God wants us to hold this thing forth, and when I say to you he is, he is worthy and deserving of whatever self-sacrifice it takes for us to live according to this book, and I say that because of the power that he's worked in us. If you're saved today, listen, if God came through here today and healed every cancer, and God, I wish he would. We, we pray, we pray on those nights. We come in here and call out every one of them names. Can y'all see them? <laughs> Hundreds. And that bottom side is cancer. And we pray over those names. And we had a night the other night. We got to take like 12 people off the prayer list. I don't think but one of them was cancer. If God came through here and healed all the cancer, if God came through here and healed all the coronavirus, if God came through here and everybody that came in limping walked out walking good, if he came through here and everybody that came in with glasses could drop them in a trash can and have perfect 20-20 vision on the way out of the building, if God did every bit of that, I want you to know it wouldn't be one iota to the power of God that was worked in you the day that God saved you. That's how powerful what God did in us was. And I ask you again, is what we're allowing God to do through us proportionate to what we've obviously enjoyed him doing in us. It humbles me. What could this world experience? <coughs> what could this world have? Did you notice when he made that statement that we as the sons of God in this crooked and perverse generation, we should shine as lights in the world. Not lights to the world or lights of the world, but lights in the world. The sunlight beaming through these windows today, so pretty you could turn these lights off and it'd still be bright in here. Well, the light that's in the church should be shining out like that. It should literally be exempt. The light in the house the other night was surging. It's going to give me a headache. You can get more attention when the light's blinking, when the light's flashing. But the job of light is not to flash or draw attention. The job of light is to illuminate. And that's what we've been called to do, is to illuminate the darkness. Calm and steady. You know the greatest gift of these lights in here this morning is that they're on. <laughs> and they're not blinking. And they're not going in and out. And they're not, they're just there shining. If you don't think about it, you won't even notice them. But if they were all off, you'd know it. Is the power getting out? Can we say today that the power's out? Is God working out of us what he's worked in us? Because that's what he's called us to let him do. So that this world might see and know that there's a God in heaven that can fix it. There's a God in heaven that can help. And if anybody knows it today, it's because they've experienced the very hand of God in their own life. If you've seen and you've experienced and you have felt and you enjoy the power of God in your life, then it's our duty to let that power work in us and through us to the good pleasure of His will. We're not His favorite. So what business do we have of taking what he's done for us and bottling it up? Why should we build a reservoir and try to keep it for ourselves? If you put water in the same place for too long, it'll contaminate. Won't be good to wash with, won't be good to drink. But if you keep it moving, keep it circulating, keep it flowing, be surprised what you can get out of it. I believe today that God's looking for a church that'll let him do through us what he's done in us. And that is to display his power to this world in this, what does he call, perverse nation. And be a light so that people can see Jesus. Are we letting the power out? So we want the power to get out in our church. We, we understand that application, that we want what God's done in the church to get out. But I want to tell you this, that in order for that to work, is it's got to happen in each of our lives. It's got to happen. If God, if God has displayed his power in my life, and if you're saved today, He's not only displayed his power, he's displayed his most powerful of powers in your life by saving your soul. And the only way our church can be a, a distributor, if you will, or, or an example, or a conduit of the power of God is we have to allow what's happening in our own lives personally to come out of each of us. And chances are, the reason nobody's ever been affected by the power of God in somebody's life is because they've never themselves experienced the power of God. You can have the church, you can have the membership, you can have baptism, you can have communion, you can have 
an ordination certificate. You can, you can have position. You can have reputation. But if you don't have Jesus, then you not only don't have anything to give, but you don't have anything yourself. When you die in that condition, you're going to go to hell. And you're going to be there forever. And it's our job not only to get us right in here because we all want all of you to be right. I want our church family. I want everybody comes through those doors, visitors, guests, friends, family, neighbors, who we get to come to this church. I want everybody that comes in this building to leave this building knowing that they know Christ, they got a home in heaven, and they're going to spend eternity there. That's what we want. That's what we hope. But we also want us to be able to take that that's been done in us out in this world and let it go through us and let this whole world know that they've also been invited to experience this same grace. To come get in on what Jesus is doing in us, what he's done for us, and what he intends to do through us. That, my friends, is the picture of the church. To do what God's called us to do. He's got the power. And he's with us. And I don't know how you take this, but that means nothing can stop us. Except us. So let's bind up and do what God's called us to do. And let's see him do a work in these last days. If you're here today and you've never been saved, why don't you stop playing this game? Why don't you stop going through these motions? You go to church for two or three weeks, you get out of church for two or three months. You go to church for a year, you get out of church for two years. You, you, you try to serve the Lord, you won't do right. You come to church on Sunday and it feels good, and it feels like the right thing to do. You go back to work Monday and you're cussing and carrying on and acting like the biggest devil on the job. Wondering where the power of God is in our lives. Our kids are going crazy. Our marriages are falling apart. Our homes are struggling. Our finances are broken. Our country is literally decaying and falling apart before our very eyes. And there are folks that think one person that sits in an Oval Office can change it. And I'm telling you, it's not. It's going to take Holy Ghost revival in the lives and hearts of the people of God. And these churches getting our minds and our hearts right and doing what God's put us here to do. And that's to be more than a vessel of entertainment and enjoyment and pleasure to people. We're here to suffer. And we're here to serve. And we're here to keep waving the banner of God and let people know that Jesus will save their soul. The only way we're really going to get after that and believe that and preach that is if we know we've experienced it ourselves. And if you're here today and you'd be willing to say it, just get honest today and say, you know what? I'm tired of this. I've done it all my life. I've been down the aisle. I've been baptized. I've joined churches, but I've never had an experience in my heart that I can say wholeheartedly was a move of the power of God that saved my soul, and I'm ready to get it settled once and for all. Why don't you come take him at his word this morning? Why don't you stop trying to do it yourself? Because nobody in here is saved today because we were good at getting saved. We're saved today because God was good at saving us. And I'm telling you today, you can keep trying and running your head against the stump all day long. But until you give up and let Jesus take over, you're going to be a miserable mess for the rest of your life. Why don't you come get it settled this morning? If you need to come pray today, if you need to come be saved today, don't you be scared of this altar. You let God have his way. Y'all stand with me. Father, we love you. Thank you so much today that we have experienced and enjoyed the power of God. And I pray today for every believer that's in this house. I pray that we as believers would let the work that's done through us be proportionate to the work that's been done in us. And I pray, God, as we ask the question, is the power going out? I pray that the answer for our church be yes. That, Lord, we're not necessarily concerned to get all, you know, all together about what comes in, but being sure that what does come in is able to go out of here with something. And so I pray, God, that everybody in here that desires to be more, that desires to do better, that desires to not only experience the power of God, but to be able to exercise and express the power of God to this world, that we would seek your face and we'd let you do a work in our hearts and help us be the believers you've called us to be. I pray, God, for that one or maybe a, 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 a number of people in here today who know in their heart they've never had a genuine salvation experience and they're tired of playing the game and they're ready to get it settled once and for all. Lord, I pray that you give them the grace to come to this old-fashioned altar. Let us take a Bible and show them how to be saved. We'll give you all the honor and glory because you're the only one that's worthy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we sing, you come this morning if you need to come. God's dealing with your heart. You come. Be glad.